And now I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, Nicolas Award. Thank, thank you very much, Manuel. Um, let me share my screen, a uh, few slides that I want to show. Um, good. So when we talk about decentralization in Africa, um, but of course, with a focus on my presentation on Ghana, but I, to give as a sort of introduction, um, we're trying to get this to work. Good. So in the late 80s and the early 90s, decentralization became the, the policy or the development policy choice uh, for many African countries, either by design or at least as a result of the reforms, uh, popular reforms that have taken place, many countries were supported by development partners to pursue decentralization uh, to solve many problems. Or of course, one of them could be the, you know, to promote participation and then during the economic recovery programs as part of uh, um, cost recovery mechanisms. Um, it was also seen as an important aspect of the good governance discourse at, then, at that time and as a, as a transition to democracy. So decentralization then was seen as basically the transfer of the responsibilities, resources, and power uh, or some of this uh, to the subnational government. And in other words, local governments, politicians, and bureaucrats were expected to be the key beneficiaries of decentralization. And, um, and they were pursued. But in many countries, by late 2000s, let's say 2010 start onwards, uh, decentralization lost its attractiveness to um, many governments, uh, although uh, they continue to pursue it. But the vigor with which they pursue decentralization lost momentum, and many development partners also uh, started questioning the sincerity of many of the governments in pursuing decentralization. So in many research reports and the articles that came during the early 2010, uh, people started questioning the sincerity of the progress that decentralization uh, was making. And in many countries, it, it became a reluctant um, pursuit by central government politicians. And conclusions that came from many of these studies uh, uh, was that, um, uh, I mean, decentralization is a zero sum game. And so power that is transferred from central government bureaucrats uh, to local government means power loss by the center. And none of these uh, senior bureaucrats want to lose the influence. Um, and it's also as well, result, uh, could be said about the politicians, but in most cases, the emphasis was on central government bureaucrats because they were the key uh, drivers of, or expected drivers of decentralization. And then, um, I mean, I remember Faliti's paper in 2015 doing the comparative asset analysis in Latin America and my own uh, uh, analysis of it. We started looking at why there is reluctant uh, pursuit of decentralization. And that the, the understanding was that in most African countries, they started decentralization along administrative or deconcentration. And once you start decentralization from that perspective, then at the end, it will not promote high degree of autonomy. Uh, and so my analysis in many countries showed that yes, uh, that has been the case. And so, fiscal decentralization or political decentralization is the last to be pursued. And that makes decentralization vulnerable uh, to be taken. Now, this is the, the let's say the, the rationale, the reason, and I try to look at it, what happened in Ghana's case. Um, oh, Ghana's major decentralization reform started in 1988. Uh, 
before then, um, we had 45 local governments, uh, local councils, and there wasn't much resources given to them. Uh, and so as part of all that, that process to improve service delivery, in 1988, uh, the military regime uh, started talking about bringing government and services closer to the people. Uh, when we say government, it was looking at uh, uh, bureaucratic services. Uh, and so right in 1988, from 45 districts or local government areas, we went into uh, one, uh, we went into uh, 110 districts. And from that time, you look at the number of people that constitute a local government jurisdiction. We were talking about uh, 209,000 people per local government jurisdiction. But by 2010, this had reduced substantially. And then in 2019, we had 260 local government units. Uh, making an average of 110 people to a local government jurisdiction. And that's as you, as you shrink the size and the population, then government fiscal becomes closer to the people. Um, and so that is an, an achievement uh, that we can talk about. Um, but, and then in 1992, as we moved towards the constitutional regime, um, a law was made to transfer 5% of the national revenue to local government. So before then, there was no automatic transfer or sharing of the national revenue with sub-national government or the local councils. And so this became a major drive, um, a major push for decentralization. And as a result of that, there'd be more infrastructure uh, uh, services or fiscal infrastructure being provided at the sub-national levels. Um, but if you look at the momentum uh, over the years, then decentralization has reached a plateau where not much rise is seen. Um, and you can see this from the perspective of revenue mobilization. Currently, less, uh, about only 1% of the national revenue is mobilized by the local governments. Um, and, this, and in terms of public expenditure, uh, that is controlled by local governments. That is about 8%, uh, you know, if you take a conservative figure, about 80%. I mean, if you compare this with global, uh, you're talking about 25% in an OECD country, 32%, and in China's case, you're talking about 3% being uh, at the, at the sub-national level uh, expenditure. And so that makes Ghana's, uh, uh, that's an indicator of a slow progress. Then most local governments are dependent on the central government. Uh, I mean, out of the 260, you can say about, let's say half may not survive if central government transfers don't go to them. Um, and that is, is some uh, worrying after 30 years of practicing decentralization reforms, you still have uh, many local governments so vulnerable that without central transfers, they cannot survive. We still have a situation where mayors continue to be appointed by the president instead of elected by the people. Uh, if you think about the fact that Ghana has a pedigree in multi-party democracy, uh, and still we have a situation where in the context of multi-party democracy, mayors all over the countries are appointed by the president. Then you also have a situation where local government service staff or civil servants at the local level are recruited, appointed, and dismissed, continue to be by the center. And then no attempt has been made to devolve that human resource totally to the local government. Um, and then in terms of service delivery, it's still controlled by central government agencies. So all of these, you begin to put question marks on in terms of the progress that we've made. Um, and so one issue is that support to uh, local government reforms have been slow. If that's been slow, the question is, what drives a state to support deepening decentralization in local government's uh, policies? And that is why I analyze Ghana's case and I see it from the political economy or political settlement perspective. If you do analysis of the distribution of power in a society uh, and how that power is embedded in an institutional setup in a multi-party democracy, then you come to the conclusion that 
there is a kind of a political settlement um, among the um, ruling elites on how to maintain a, a, a type of decentralization that suits or that favor the center more than the local level. And then you do another political economy analysis of the power, interest, and influence of key actors that drive it. Then you come to the conclusion that there are three key objectives of ruling elites in, in Ghana. How to maintain the political stability of the country, how to secure incumbency of the ruling government, and how to promote rapid economic development. And in this three, the power or the need to stay in power supersedes the rest. And so decentralization policies or deepening it is chosen on the basis that it will help maintain the ruling government in power. And this is not only this year, but since 1992, when we started democracy. And so what is the political settlement issues here? Ghana's decentralization is designed in such a way that to deepen it requires constitutional review. When Rawlings military regime, when it designed it, it designed it to suit their setup at that time. And so it banned the participation of political parties. It bans the election of the mayors by the citizens. And that suited them. And over the years, when we have seen a very competitive multi-party democracy, then ruling governments have tended to use that to strengthen their, their, their local base by appointing you know, party functionaries or by appointing uh, party, should I say, quote unquote, boys and girls or foot soldiers to, you know, uh, to, let's say, to position themselves um, uh, to win election. And given the competitive nature of our politics, where about 50% um, stay in opposition uh, because we have a very system of winner takes all. And in most countries, uh, in, in, in most contests, the winner takes between 51, you know, to 53%. So what you see is that you have about half of the population in opposition and they do everything to win election. And so because of that, ruling elites use decentralization as it is designed at the moment to solidify their, 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 their position. And any attempt to reform it uh, is it, not accepted. And so in 2019, government started the process of reviewing the constitution to enable the people elect. Um, however, when the politics went into eight, government had to withdraw because there was no consensus among the two major political parties that have stayed in power since 1992 or that have changed power since 1992. So that this duopoly is said that to change or to deepen the, uh, decentralization means that potentially you could this, uh, make about half of the population uncomfortable. And that means you losing power uh, easily. And given that in these two parties, the ruling government have constantly about 48% of its dedicated voters to vote for it. And the opposition also have about 47%. So the, the, the key swing votes are just less than uh, six or seven percent. And so you don't design or you don't change a policy that we're going to make a, a, a whole lot of population uncomfortable and you will lose elections. So because of that, they will not. Then the second reason or the second rationale from political economy analysis or political settlement analysis is that there's lack of co uh, coherent development policy or a long-term horizon that they look at. Because for every four years is electoral cycle of which if you are not careful, opposition will be election because of the nature of our political settlement, because of the nature of the swing votes. And government had then look at uh, what will let win election. And what will let them win election is by provide, providing short-term development uh, activity or development. 
and development is understood as the provision of public goods and services, not in terms of the coherent policy that you have, uh, but it's about you know, physical infrastructure. And so for, once election is done, government spends the time providing infrastructure, you know, water, and that is seen as who provides it. It doesn't matter whether it is provided at the local level. Uh, whoever provides that service is what the citizens care about. And that is where decentralization to local governments uh, to provide these services are not given much attention because citizens don't really care about whether those services are provided by the private sector or by the public sector or by the state agencies. And so that keeps the, the center in control. Recently, that was 2020, there was an attempt to decentralize basic education, basic health care, when the uh, unions rose against the idea of seeing themselves working at the local level or being controlled from local government, they protested. And it was election year, uh, and government resigned its decision to decentralize these services. And so you, you, you can see. And currently, there's an attempt to even re-centralize the collection of property rates. Um, and the understanding is that as long as the money will be collected eff effectively, it doesn't matter who collects them. And so that is the, a key um, issue here. Then the third is the declining influence of development partners in decentralization. When decentralization started in Africa in the 80s and also in Ghana, donors played a substantial role, both in terms of technical support and financial. Araba, with the implementation of the sector-wide approach, um, donor influence uh, in terms of technical has dwindled a lot. And because of that, their influence uh, in the policy drive has also weakened. And as long as Ghana is having uh, political stability, donors wouldn't want to push for some of these reforms. And so uh, that is another actor that is not able uh, to influence deepening of decentralization. And finally, uh, which I have mentioned this, is this ideological shift. The idea of government stepping back uh, and providing an enabling role for state and non-state actors to deliver services also becoming something that is weakening devolution because at, at the moment, government believes that services can be provided through deconcentrated state agencies and not necessarily giving total devolution to uh, local government. And so the question then becomes uh, ideologically uh, whether services or effectiveness uh, matters, sorry, efficiency matters more than the, the effectiveness. And the two cannot uh, go together at the same time in terms of the ideology of the state giving more responsibilities to the private sector uh, to deliver services. So in conclusion, um, I, I want to say that this decentralization or the idea of deepening decentralization and, and, and local governance uh, is weakening, uh, is becoming slow in Ghana because of the nature of our political settlement or the, the, the nature of our competitive capitalistic uh, democracy that uh, we have. And given that ruling elites want to maintain their hold on power and uh, to do that mean that you do not um, say the uh, you know um, undertake a policy that will affect substantial number of people who currently benefit from that uh, uh, policy and that decentralization currently benefit uh, uh, the ruling elites, many of them who are senior civil servants and and politicians and and the local level. Um, uh, coalition. And so to deepen this it means to take influence away from them. And that is something that they are not happy about. And so what the government is doing now is to balkanize big municipalities into small, small, small municipalities and sharing power and resources to many of its um, lower level coalition. So unfortunately, deepening decentralization 
is becoming like a, a threat instead of a catalyst to winning election and staying in power. And that is what uh, is weakening uh, the uh, Ghana's decentralization. And I, I guess many of these may resonate with what happens in uh, what is happening in many African countries as well. Thanks very much.